from the Hudson Media Group Studios. This is Talking Politics, and I am the professor, Fernando Uribe. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get started. This is what I'm thinking about right now. Now, folks, last week, I spent a good amount of time during my opening monologue discussing the, the benefits of marijuana decriminalization and outright legalization here in the Garden State. And sure enough, what do we see in the news feed coming up just a few days later? Well, State Senate President Steve Sweeney, along with Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin, and members of the legislature may perhaps explore these two topics during the lame duck session of the legislature right now before the end of 2019. Now let me just sort of unpackage this a little bit with some facts and some stats that I think should be interesting for you at the same time raise awareness about how, how vital this topic is for New Jersey residents. Now I just want to sort of uh, bear by mentioning a fellow insider NJ colleague by the name of Carl Golden who coincidentally is a contributing analyst with the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy down in South Jersey at Stockton University. I had a great article on Insider NJ last week sort of detailing some of the pitfalls that still await the legislature before the end of the year. Now, as I talked about last week, folks, decriminalization needs to happen now. Again, some stats that should really make you cringe and at the same time remind you about how important this topic really is to New Jersey residents from all demographics and all age groups. Again, for the first 10 months of 2019, over 31,000 New Jersey residents have been arrested for marijuana-related offenses. It comes out to about one arrest every 14 minutes. And I talked about it last week, and I'll say it again. This is completely unacceptable, not just by our criminal justice system, but more so by the apathy demonstrated by the legislature by not addressing this sooner. Now, whether or not State Senate President Steve Sweeney, Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin can get together with Governor Murphy, who, by the way, folks, let's, let's remember, during the summer of 2017, then-candidate Phil Murphy had pledged that within the first 100 days of his administration, he would have marijuana legalization. Well, clearly that didn't happen. January 1st, 2018 came and went, and the governor still didn't have any sort of bill on his desk for signature. Now, a couple of things here to sort of unravel as well. One of the more interesting aspects about not just recent columns and statistics for us is the idea that, you know what, and let's be very clear, marijuana consumers deserve and they demand equal rights throughout the state and the protections under our laws that are currently afforded to drinkers, let's say, of far more dangerous and a deadly yet perfectly legally used and widely accepted, as well as endlessly advertised, toxicant, which is alcohol. Now listen, I'm not advocating for prohibition. We did that well over 100 years ago. As we all know, history tells us it didn't work. Well, clearly, folks, marijuana prohibition has not worked either. Since the mid-1980s, the war on drugs has been an abject failure. And it's not because I'm like some sort of, you know, devoted liberal or very sort of, you know, apathetic conservative. Folks, I'm just a reasonable, commonsensical, everyday American. We've seen over... $5 billion being spent in the war on drugs since the mid-80s. And what has it done? It's done absolutely nothing. It's made our borders dangerous, marijuana, and even hardcore drug usage is still as high as it's ever been. And you know what? There's no solution in sight. But when it comes to marijuana here in New Jersey, the legislature can do something. The legislators, whether, again, it's the aforementioned individuals or the 80 assemblymen and women or the 40 state senators, have to get together before 2019. Folks, sort of, you know, listen, the idea that there are still politicians in New Jersey who demonize marijuana. We've seen corrupt law enforcement officials who, let's be, let's be clear also, would prefer to ruin people's lives over marijuana possession rather than sort of solve the crimes that actually fund their departments. This is unacceptable, folks. And listen, we, we get it. Marijuana arrests are very profitable. It gives all these fancy toys and all these sort of inflated salaries to local police departments all around the state. Now, let me bear by mentioning as well, that's not anti-law enforcement, but I'm also sort of talking about how really erroneous this is along policy lines. And we still haven't seen a solution in sight. And at the same time, listen, let's sort of talk about what's really at stake here. It's about helping, them, it's helping really black and brown people in New Jersey who smoke marijuana at the same rate as their white counterparts, but they face harsher and more punitive sentences in our criminal justice system. Well, that's just blatantly unfair. And I've talked about it on this show repeatedly, and I'll continue to talk about it until something gets done in Trenton. Folks, again, before I entered academia, I had the privilege of working in our criminal justice system for 10 years, both as a probation officer in the judiciary and also as an investigator with the Office of the Public Defender. I worked at some of the most voluminous county jails in all of the state, the Hudson County Jail in Kearney and the Essex County Jail in Newark. Folks, I met people from all demographics and all socioeconomic backgrounds. And when I see people continuously being incarcerated for marijuana, no offense to anybody in the law enforcement community, but it's just wrong. And I'm hoping that legislators throughout the state of New Jersey can hear my plea. Again, whether it happens before the end of the year or even worse, 
waiting for this to be put on a ballot measure in 2020, well, that's just unacceptable. And I get it. Maybe the, the rationale is, hey, there's going to be a massive turnout in November of 2020. Oh, I wonder why. Hmm. Maybe the presidential election, maybe a U.S. Senate seat will be up for grabs, as well as all the congressional House seats will be up for grabs next November. So, of course, the legislature feels, well, you know what? Let's just rely on the massive turnout that will come in November of 2020. But quite frankly, it should have happened in November of 2019. Now, I understand that assembly races aren't sexy, but there were a lot of competitive and very interesting municipal races all throughout New Jersey's 21 counties. And there was turnout. Now, of course, it wasn't a turnout that we would normally expect in other years. But folks, it was, I would argue, a bill that needed to be put on the ballot box, and it wasn't. Now, whether State Senate President Steve Sweeney, Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin were just being lazy, hey, some will debate that that's the, that's the case. I would just argue that they weren't motivated, but they should be. We keep incarcerating people in New Jersey far too long for marijuana. And as I said before, listen, I don't have a stake in this race. I don't smoke marijuana. I never have. I don't care to. If you ask me, give me a glass of red wine on any day of the week and evening, and you know what? I'm just as happy. But I also don't want to infringe upon people's rights. And, that's, and this is where it comes down to, and this is what I think the legislature needs to address. Okay, if you love marijuana, great. Smoke it. Enjoy it. If you want to purchase a dispensary, you want to be an entrepreneur and open it and make it accessible to the public at a reasonable price. Hey, listen, we regulate tobacco and, al and alcohol, don't we? Don't we see commercials year after year for alcohol or for tobacco? No, of course, listen, we've all learned the harmful effects of both intoxicants. But for whatever reason, there still seems to be this stigma attached to marijuana usage. And I get it. We all grew up going to school here in New Jersey, whether we enrolled in the D.A.R.E. program or we just learned right from the 80s to just say no. And I understand that. There's that stigma that still exists about any sort of drug usage, specifically starting with marijuana. Now, whether it's a gateway drug or not, hey, listen, I'm not a medical doctor, but as an academic, I know what research tells me. And the research tells me that it isn't. It's been proven to be harmless and nowhere near as, as harmful as alcohol and tobacco are collectively. And guess what? We continue to sort of fill up our jails. We continue to, at the same time, put people in jail unnecessarily. And who's, and who's getting incarcerated? You guessed it again, folks, black and brown people, at such a high rate that it's scary. I'm hoping that the legislature takes this lame duck session into account. And when we look at some stats here, folks, I mean, really, like I said, it's the implementation of a successful ballot question that, you know what, if it takes that in November of 2020, perhaps, you know what, maybe that'll do the trick. It should have happened sooner. It should have happened a lot more expeditiously, and at the same time, it should have happened much more expediently at the hands of the, of, of the legislature. So, you know, again, as the end of the year approaches, I'm hoping that the legislature takes the time to look at all the valuable issues. Listen, decriminalize it. The idea of, listen, if you want to still issue a summons, that's fine, but jail time is unnecessary. When we all know that hardcore drug usage is intensely correlated with violent crime, whether it's robbery, you know, sexual assaults, or homicides, people are committing these acts and more because of hardcore drugs, cocaine, crack, you know, opioids, heroin. No one's committing criminal felonies, folks, based on marijuana. Not because I have experienced it, it's because the stats tell us that, okay? It depresses our nervous system. It's not gonna motivate people to engage in violent acts or tantrums. We've seen that. So why do we keep, keep putting people in jail? I don't get it, and I still don't understand it. And I'm hoping that during the lame duck session, again, that Governor Murphy will implore the State Senate and the State Assembly to get this right. Whether, listen, it's about outright decriminalization or legalizing it altogether, New Jerseyans have to implore their legislators to get this right before it's too late. We're putting too many people in jail, ladies and gentlemen, and quite frankly, it's unacceptable, it's unconscionable, and more importantly, it's unwarranted. I'm hoping that everybody in Trinity can hear me today, because you know what? New Jersey residents are on the prowl, and they're really focusing on this issue. And to at least the legislators, you know what? If you're not getting the job done, you might have to lose your job just to learn how important this issue really is in Trenton and to all of New Jerseyans alike. And that's what I'm thinking about right now. In the latest edition of the three-time award-winning podcast, Talk on the Hudson, which you can listen to live every Wednesday night by going to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Talk on the Hudson, was the newly reelected councilman in the first ward of Hoboken, Mike DeFusco. He was on with me for over 70 minutes, and while he had well, while he had a lot to say about his re-election and certainly his future plans, he's very dedicated in amending policy and making sure the Hoboken residents can live as best as possible. We start off by discussing how really ecstatic he was in getting re-elected and how he didn't take anything for granted 
leading up to election day. Let's hear what he had to say. Uh, you won with some very strong numbers. And really, I think it's a testament to how popular you remain in Hoboken. How tough was this campaign, Michael? Well, listen, I, I appreciate the kind words. Um, I'm still amazed four years into my service to this community that my community has stood behind me. And I know that sounds contrived to say, but it has truly been my honor to serve uh, downtown Hoboken after the past four years. And <clears throat> myself and my campaign team didn't take anything for granted as we ran this, uh, um, as we ran this election. And, um, and I was surprised to see the numbers. I truly was, because although we've done amazing things over the past four years, not just in downtown Hoboken in the first ward, but citywide, um, uh, you know, it's, it's constantly um, uh, an honor to see my neighbors support me in my push to bring new energy and new ideas to Hoboken. Well, listen, it was certainly a challenge, and we'll get into some of the hurdles you had to face. Uh, but, Mike, let's be honest, man, and this is what this program's all about. Uh, it's no secret uh, you and Mayor Ravi Bala don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, maybe on, on, on anything. But, you know, maybe you can clarify that for me in a moment. But it seemed like this election was very personal to you. Uh, a lot of people off the air and sources I talked to told me that this was really personal on Election Day. And it was really satisfying for you to win, not just to win the way you did. But let's be honest, you won, but it wasn't just scraping by on the goal line. I mean, you won by a few touchdowns here to sort of talk about it metaphorically, Michael. Yeah, you know, we, 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 we won two to one on Election Day. Uh, and you're absolutely right. This was a very personal election for me. When I first ran for office four years ago against a 21-year incumbent, it was for the right reasons. We believed at that time that standing up to the political establishment was the right thing to do. And we staged a grassroots election, uh, and we won. Uh, two years later, against the odds, we, um, we put up a, a stand against Dawn Zimmer uh, to run for mayor. She dropped out of the election, and Ravi jumped in along with a, a, a handful of other candidates. And we lost that election by 400 votes. Um, and the, the messaging out of the mayor's camp was that I, I somehow was really caught up on that election. Um, and although it's always tough to lose, especially amidst the, uh, the negative uh, connotations that surrounded 2017, um, I've always been honored to serve this city. So this was my first chance to show uh, not just Hoboken and Hudson County, but myself, that the work we've done here in the first ward um, resonates with voters, right? It's not that I need a mayor to support me. It's not that I need uh, a 21 year council person to support me. Um, I ran on my merits. I ran with the support of my neighbors and my opponent ran with the political class behind her. She ran with two mayors of Hoboken. and she ran with uh, the former councilwoman. Um, and despite that, and despite the, um, unprecedented influence of a super PAC, an independent expenditure that came in uh, and funneled in uh, $30,000 the week before the election, we still won. So, yes, it was personal to me. You know, of course it was personal to me because I wanted to show myself, no one else, I wanted to show myself that the work that I've dedicated myself to over the past four years has resonated. And that's why I started out the show by saying I was really honored to continue uh, my service to this city. So it's with a sense of gratitude uh, and a, an excitement and a hope for the future that, uh, that this election uh, you know, transpired the way it did. Moving along, we talked about his representation within the LGBT community. Now, Councilman DeFusco is the first openly elected LGBT member anywhere, not just in Hudson County, but really throughout New Jersey. At the time that he was elected, you know what? He's made strides and he's made history. But more importantly, he's looking to make results for Hoboken residents not just for the LGBT community, but Hoboken homeowners, renters, and taxpayers alike can look forward to another four years of him in office on the city council, fighting for taxpayers and advocating for a better and more reasonably priced quality of life in Hoboken. Let's check out what he had to say about it. And to think that today you would serve on the city council, on one of you know, Hudson County's largest cities. Let's be honest, one of the most famous cities in America. It's the birthplace of Sinatra. It's the birthplace of baseball. Um, for you to represent the LGBT community the way you are doing so. Could you have envisioned this 5, 10, 15 years ago, Mike? I really couldn't have. You know, I was just out with a neighbor uh, an hour before I joined you, um, and he was asking how, um, how I got involved and, and what politics has meant to me. And I told him that 
as um, as a young gay man, recently out of the closet in 2004, 2005, when I first moved to Hoboken, um, I was lost. I didn't really, I didn't know myself. I didn't know my career. I didn't, you know, um, I really didn't know um, who I was becoming. But this community of Hoboken um, taught me how a community operates, walking down the street and meeting my neighbors, the corner store, uh, you know, knowing people uh, around this city created a sense of purpose for me um, when I was lacking it, when I was much younger. And I see that in a lot of people today. When I knock on doors and I talk to a lot of young people, gay or straight, um, or in between, and they say, how do I get involved? And I see an excitement in their eyes because sometimes corporate America, nine to five jobs aren't fulfilling. Sometimes they're not finding the sense of purpose. And I say, come get involved. And who knows, maybe you'll like serving this community. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll like having an idea that we can see through. Maybe you won't. But have a say in the place that you live. And that's, to me, the most exciting part about my journey personally and my journey politically is that it's not necessarily about being gay, but as a gay man, I found a lot of happiness um, in the inclusivity of this city. And who I became is because of Hoboken, and um, and it's really important to note that. So my message of inclusion stems from me uh, and uh, and who I am, and that's what I try to offer up to anybody, uh, gay, straight, um, um, young, old, that wants to get involved. Your voice is important. Your opinions matter, and you can make a difference, and that's the most important message I can send uh, to the community. And Chairwoman DeGee's, uh certainly um, supports that. And her creation of many caucuses, the LGBTQ caucus that I chair, um, uh, just to name one, uh, is uh, indicative of her inclusive approach to bringing Hudson County together uh, to build a stronger Democratic Party and even outside of the Democratic Party, stronger neighborhoods where everybody has a voice. I doubt he had a lot to say for over 70 minutes. Now, you can listen to the episode of the podcast in its entirety by going to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Talk in the Hudson. You can do so from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet. You can listen to it anywhere at any time. Again, special thanks to newly reelected Councilman Mike DeFusco in the First Ward of Hoboken for his time and for a lot of insightful conversation, which I think Hoboken residents and Hudson County residents alike will get to enjoy on the podcast. Now, folks, to some local stories that should really capture your attention. Now, staying in the Mile Square City, despite sort of a, a remarkably very peaceful election day with no, you know, no incidents and no tantrums and really no sort of, you know, not violence, but hysteria that seems to sort of accompany election day in the Mile Square City, voter turnout actually was up 10 percent from 2015. Now, the city council races without a doubt generate considerable interest, not just for the five incumbents, but for the five council candidates that Mayor Ravi Bala was running against them. Without a doubt, as we've talked about previously on this program, the mayor was looking to shape the face of the city council more in his ideology, but more so on his platform. Short of Phil Cohen, everybody else on the mayor's ticket came up short on election day. Whether it was Jen Giatino, Mike Russo, or even Mike DeFusco, the incumbents enjoyed overwhelming support And guess what? In some words, an overwhelming victory. Without a doubt here, and again, a special shout out to my colleague in the media here via the Hudson County View, John Hines. In 2015, we saw 1,534 ballots were cast in Hoboken's first ward, which went down slightly, only to 1,499 last week. And other wards saw a little bit of a a bump, and some other ones sort of remained kind of stagnant. But But without a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that was not a surprise was in the third ward, where uncontested in 2015, Councilman Russo received 735 votes along with 48 personal choice writing votes, making for 783 total votes. Now this is what makes, sort of makes his candidacy interesting as we know that Mike Russo's name is being floated as a potential mayoral candidate in 2021. We know that Mike DeFusco, obviously with a strong reelection bid, also sort of elevated his stock and you know what? His political capital skyrocketed as a result of winning another term and more so trying to get into the mayoral race in 2021. Even during the recent episode of the podcast, he wasn't really dwelling on 2021, but dwelling more about working with the mayor for the next two years in advocating for Hoboken residents. It remains to be seen what will happen, obviously, 
in the Moss Square City. And without a doubt, it should be very interesting to talk about for the next few months ahead here, not just in the Moss Square City, but also in Hudson County overall. Keeping it in Hoboken, to no one's surprise, Hoboken political operative Frank Rea and his sentencing was indeed postponed once again. Now, shout out to uh, John Hines via the Hudson County View for an update this week about what's going on with this voter by mail fraud case. Now, again, Frank Rea, along with Dio Praxton, are now, sentenced, are now due to be sentenced on November the 19th at 10 a.m. at the federal building, according to recent court records. Now, Frank Rea, who six years ago was seeking a council at large seat and also pushing to sort of loosen the city's rent control laws via a ballot question, had some of his closest allies testify against him during his trial, a move that many interested parties believed ultimately sealed his fate. Now, again, he was convicted on June 26, largely due to the, part, to the fact of the testimony of cooperating federal witnesses, Matt Caliccio, Michael Holmes, and Freddie Frazier. Now, his counsel filed the motion on June 9th this summer, later claiming in August, during a brief submitted that time, that the testimony of the aforementioned could not be trusted since they were, quote, trying to avoid prosecution or severe sentences. Currently, Frank Rea faces a maximum sentence of five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Folks, this is something that really boils my blood because it reminds us that voter fraud is real. It's not just some sort of conservative talking point you hear on Fox News or conservative media or sort of like the minimization in the liberal media, whether it's on CNN or MSNBC. Voter fraud is real. Look no further than the Mile Square City. And we always sort of rely on elections to be fair, to be equitable, and to be honest. And when you have low lives like Frank Rea and, of course, the rest of them here, and folks, I mean, listen, we can't minimize again the, exactly the damage that his fellow degenerates like Matt Caliccio, Michael Holmes, Freddie Frazier, and even Dio Praxton are doing to the electoral process. I get it. They may think they're slick and they may think they're sort of getting away with it. But guess what? Thankfully, they didn't. And I'm glad that the federal government is sort of being harsh and hopefully they'll be punitive on Frank Rea. But you know what? They should also make an example of the other stooges that work with Frank Rea to undermine the electoral process in Hoboken. Because you know what? It's not just in Hoboken. It happens all the time. And that's one of the bad things that comes with New Jersey politics. It's sort of like that awful reputation that precedes it. That it's corrupt here. It's, called, it's been called the Soprano State. Well, you know what? Look no further than what happened in Hoboken. Frank Rea tried to undermine the electoral process and just tried to undermine democracy. That's not hyperbole by me. I'm not trying to be bombastic or hyperbolic in any way, but it's a reminder that we should always be vigilant on Election Day. We should be aware of what's going on. We should hold these people accountable. It's unacceptable, folks when operatives think they're above the law. And we saw that in Hoboken. Now again, I have no access to the federal judge or even the prosecutors in this case, but you know what? I'm hoping the U.S. attorneys recommend the maximum penalty for Frank Rea and his fellow lowlifes. Because you know what they're doing? They're making us lose faith in elections. They're making us lose faith in the fact that democracy is still somewhat equitable and still honest and upstanding. Well, guess what? In Hoboken, it wasn't. And mark my words, folks, this is going back some years. Don't, also be, don't be surprised that even in recent elections, the other operatives might get their hands dirty too. Again, I, whether or not you believe in it or, or whether you believe the accusations or not. Again, folks, a jury of his peers convicted Frank Rea, and I'm glad he's going to jail. He should go to jail. Search so everybody else in that list with him, because you know what? It's not funny. It's not something we should like, sort of dismiss or just look at in a cavalier manner. Voter fraud is to be taken seriously. And I'm really hoping the U.S. Attorney's Office, here's my plea, in terms of sending these guys to jail and make an example out of them. I get it. They're not the most violent and more ser most serious offenders we think about in today's society. There are rapists, people committing murders, people committing you know, you know, acts against children, and I get that. Those are the violent offenders we should be focused on. But you know what? Let's make an example of these people that are trying to undermine our elections, whether it's at the local level, you know, it happens at the state level, hey, it even happens at the, at the national level. This is unacceptable. It's something that, as far as I'm concerned, should be taken seriously. And I really hope that Frank Reyes sees justice, and I really hope that his, that his accomplices see justice too. Just because you want to sing like a, you know, like a little bird and sort of cooperate with the U.S. attorneys doesn't mean you should get off any easier. Whether it's Matt Caliccio or anybody else within that group, you know what? If you commit an illegal act, you should pay the consequences. Folks, we're living in this sort of climate right now that accountability is sort of frowned upon. We should hold people accountable. We should hold them, hold them responsible to their actions. And you know what? I'm hoping that happens for Frank Rea and his operatives. They're not above the law. And if they think they are, well, they're sadly mistaken. And I'm hoping that the U.S. Attorney and the sentencing judge alike make an example out of them. Lastly, folks, 
sort of an update from last month during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which we celebrate every October. But I was proud to partner with the North Hudson Regional Firefighters Association and the North Hudson Regional Fire Officers Association, the locals 3950 and 3951, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month for a professor's quest to save breasts. And you'll be happy to know that between our collaborative efforts, my fundraising, and their fundraising uh, together, we raised $7,539 to benefit the American Cancer Society, but more importantly, the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer campaign. Collectively, since 2008, you'll be proud to know that my philanthropic efforts with the American Cancer Society have raised $50,348. It's helping men, women, and children alike with the valuable resources and other amenities that the American Cancer Society works so hard to collect every year. Folks, breast cancer is a serious problem, and it still remains it. But you know what? With the hard work by, again, locals 3950 and 3951 here in Hudson County and other fundraisers throughout the state, we're trying to do at least as best of a job as possible to raise awareness, not only during October, but throughout the rest of the year. So again, I want to give my sincerest thanks to all of my generous sponsors, all of my generous attendees during a professor's quest to save breasts back in October at Ventana's in Fort Lee. But most importantly, I want to thank the hardworking firefighters, both in locals 3950 and 3951, for their, de their dedication, their long hours, and quite frankly, their persistence in selling t-shirts, and quite frankly, generating considerable revenue that together we were able to donate to the American Cancer Society in 2019. Again, folks, it's not about you know, awards, it's not about accolades, it's about making a difference. And I'm proud to say that along with locals 3950 and 3951, we did that. Without a doubt, folks, it's important to get involved in any sort of philanthropy, but more importantly, in breast cancer awareness, where it affects so many of our friends, our family members, our neighbors, our colleagues, anybody we know. Breast cancer has to be defeated. And you know what? In 2019, all of us together went a very long way in doing that. To check out all the excellent programming offered by the Hudson Media Group, go to their websites, www.hmgtvshows.com and also www.livestream.com forward slash HMGTV. Don't forget to like the Hudson Media Group on Facebook and also follow them on Twitter and Instagram. In addition, Talking Politics is proud to partner with NJ On Air, and you can check out all of their wonderful programming on their website, www.njonair.com. You can also download the app from any, from any Android or Apple device, and you can watch all of the outstanding programming offered by NJ On Air on there as well, in addition to your tablet, your PC, and your Mac. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and also follow them on Instagram. Don't forget, every Wednesday night live at 9 p.m., you can listen to the three-time award-winning Talk in the Hudson by going to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Talk in the Hudson. You can listen to the episodes anywhere at any time, once again, from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet. Recent guests have included Hoboken Mayor Ravi Bala, Hoboken Councilman Mike DeFusco, Jersey City Chief Prosecutor Jake Hudnut, in addition to HCDO Chairwoman Amy DeGees, and much more. Folks, without a doubt, I make it a point to bring you reputable and informative programming every single week, not just only on the podcast, but more importantly here with the Hudson Media Group. You've come to depend on us to be credible, to have integrity, and to be honest and accurate. And you know what? We all do that here at the Hudson Media Group. So we thank you for your support, and we thank you for continuing to tune in each and every week on all of our online platforms, and of course, to check out all of our content on social media. Without a doubt, we're coming to you here and we're trying to make a difference in not just the field of journalism, but also in what we're doing to make sure that we're informative, that we're illuminating, and most importantly, that we're interesting to you, our loyal Hudson County audience. Again, folks, never forget, if it's unfiltered, unbiased, and unafraid, you know it's always Talking Politics right here with the Hudson Media Group.